like it's turning to. Uh, all right, so uh, I'm going to call the meeting to order. Um, thank you all for coming out tonight. This is a great, it's a great turnout. Uh, so uh, first thing is to review and approve the agenda. I assume that there are no changes um, to the agenda. Um, and all right, so on, on to, uh, I'm going to assume that we. Uh, you can do it by unanimous exactly. consent. <laughs> well, right, exactly, without objection, uh, agenda is approved. Um, so I, I do want to uh, um, uh, uh, frame this for us, um, just so that people can be aware as to like how we got to where we are, are where we are right now. Um, so the the first thing um, to mention is that uh, so I was the district two uh, uh, rep and uh, was elected to that seat last year, um, and uh, there's been a, a little bit of confusion I think about um, what. Uh, the, the process uh, could have been or, uh, or what it is. Um, so I just want to make sure that it's, that it's clear. So anytime someone steps down from the council, um, it is an appointment. Some people ask me, uh, you know, why isn't this a special election? Um, and that's just not um, the, the provision that we have um, in the charter to do to, to replace somebody. Um, and uh, so the, the proper process for us is to have an appointment. Um, we, the, the way I anticipate this going is I uh, will ha uh, invite some uh, the, the uh, candidates to come make a statement and then uh, the, the council members um, can ask questions of those council or of the, uh, of the candidates. Um, then the, we'll offer a chance for the public to um, make uh, their comments. And then we're going to go into executive session. And so there was also a question that I've been feeling about, why are you going to an executive session? And again, um, that's actually totally normal, just for a little context. Um, uh, in, in times past when there's been an appointment, um, not just to the city council, but to, to any um, uh, seat where there are more candidates than there are seats to fill, we go into an executive session um, for for everyone's uh, for everyone's sake. Um, I think it's um, you know important that we're able to do that. Um, and again, just for context, other appointments that have happened um, in the recent past. I was actually originally appointed uh, when Sarah Jarvis stepped stepped off the the council and. Um, and Jean Olson was appointed uh, recently when Ter Terry Gerlain stepped on the, uh, off the council. So um, having said all of that, um, I'm going to stop talking um, and invite I'm to get to it. Let's get to it. So um, I'd love to invite uh, the uh, candidates to come make any statement that they would like to make. And counselors, if you have questions, just be ready to ask them when they're done. So actually, one other note. Sorry, I almost forgot. Um, for the public's sake, uh, the council uh, has been talking about having some kind of structure for public comment. Uh, when there are lots of people who want to speak, uh, we want to hear from you all, but we can't let you speak forever. Um, and so we're going to ask that you keep your comments to two minutes, and I re recognize that that's short, uh, but uh, we're going to help you with the timing. If you have, you know, further comments, we certainly want to hear them. Uh, and this is this is going to be a, a standing thing going on into the future. So, um, if in the future you have uh, more comments that you'd like to make that don't fit in two minutes, please do let us know. We want to hear them. Just um, be conscious that we might want to hear them in writing. Um, but we do have to keep these uh, meetings moving. So, uh, for the sake of uh, of that time uh, or keeping people. Two, two, two minutes. Um, we have a couple of options for you. Um, we've got that's a helpful. timer thing, um, so that's that's option one. Option two um, is that someone else can time it. And um, Donna, do you do you want to explain what? We, we can show this, and you can watch. This is like a tablet with a timer, and so you can know when you're two minutes. Or I can just tell you. That'd be easy. So whichever you want, <laughs> when you come up, you can just say. Use the timer, please, or just tell me. And Donna, how are you going to tell people? Well, I can tell you your time's up. I also have, if you don't want to be verbally interrupted, I have colored cards. <laughs> so I'm a Toastmaster. We do a lot in two minutes. So, so really, you know, we want you to be comfortable. We're just trying to be fair about dividing the time. So if, if it's all right with the council and people come up, you tell me if you want to use this or you want you mean use the cards you just tell me what, what work best for you I do have a yellow so at a minute no no absolutely at a minute and a half and then when your two is up sorry yeah, yeah. Uh, 
there was somebody else I was going to say. Man, I can't remember. Thank you, Donna, for that, um, uh, for helping us out with that. Uh, and uh, just for tonight, because of the, the um, situation we're in, we're not going to limit the candidates to two minutes. You can have as much time as you need. Relative. <laughs> really? I mean, right. I could just going too long. No <laughs> But no, th we'll make a note of that. <laughs> oh. So, okay. I'm just saying. Okay, so, um, uh, okay, great. So without um, further ado, I... Uh, whoever would like to go first, I mean, we can do this alphabetically, alphabetically um, by, I suppose, last name. Right? Okay. Um, so that puts us. Uh, it is the same either way. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Doesn't matter. Okay. Do you want to go true. first? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Is, is this? Uh, would you like me to step somewhere else? I um, imagine. Well, so really for the sake of the room. camera, where's good? Where's best for you? Mm -hmm. I'll move behind Ashley there. Okay. I can, I can, I can slide. Yeah, I can slide. Okay. I'm not part of the decision. Go this way. Thing, so I can. That has gone. Yeah. Oh, that's good. I feel like I don't right know. I can too. So um, I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight and participating in our democracy. It's a wonderful thing. Thank you to all the audience for coming out and supporting your preferred candidate, and thank you to the council for taking the time to carefully consider all the candidates' attributes and qualities. Uh, I want to talk about who I am. I'm a public servant, and I have been for the last 10 years in service to the state. And the reason that I chose this role and this career is because I feel strongly that one of the best things we can do in our lives is give back to our community. And I've been doing this at the state for 10 years. And I thought that this was the perfect opportunity to bring that down to the local level. And so two and a half months ago, I decided to run for city council. <clears throat> so I made this decision. And this process of running a campaign, it was, it was a lot. I've been campaigning now for two and a half months. Um, I've met hundreds of district residents over the course of at least seven um, uh, meet the candidate or uh, forums and meetings, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, I've canvassed 70% of our district on foot. I've hung over 800 door tags. And I built a website. I've emailed countless people, talked to countless people on the phone or in person. And it's been a lot. I've even I even took the opportunity to attend all of the city council meetings, except one, um, leading up to today when I made that decision. Just so that the first day, if I was able to sit on the city council, I'd be prepared for this position. And when I was getting my signatures, I even got cross-examined by an attorney on College Street <laughs> for a half hour. <laughs> Not kidding you, it was very cold. <laughs> and by the end of it, I got a signature. <laughs> so, uh, you know, but the campaign's over, and we are here today. And I would think one of the top priorities that's facing a council over the next year is really going to be expansion of housing opportunities in Montpelier. And I think that all the councilors bring a unique experience and skill set to achieving this goal. But I think there's some areas that are perhaps underrepresented, areas that my background and my skill set could possibly address. So one of the most wonderful ways to expand housing, I think everybody could agree, is revitalizing our community by taking commercial and residential properties like the French Block and bringing those back into use. I have experience, four years of experience, serving the state in the role of a brownfield site manager. In this role, I managed millions of dollars so that we could help revitalize uh, contaminated or underutilized or abandoned properties. We have a few of those here in Montpelier, and they happen to be somewhat large. And if we're talking about expanding our population, then we're also talking about, um, excuse me, if we're, if we're expanding our footprint onto that of Greenland, then we're talking about stormwater considerations. 
And I was responsible as a consultant earlier in my career, building the stormwater model for the city of South Burlington along the Route 7 corridor, which is one of the most impaired watersheds in our state. And with all this, we're talking about expanding our population. Our infrastructure is gonna be taxed. At Agency of Transportation, I'm part of a team that is responsible for building a software solution that manages our $600 million annual budget. To say that you need to understand the budgeting process in order to build a system to manage it is an understatement. We're also talking about straining our city resources if we're expanding our population. There's no, there's no avoiding it. And I've spent my career at the state trying to modernize our city services, excuse me, our state services, through the adoption of software, largely. We've brought paper processes into the paperless world. We've made information more accessible online to the taxpayers. And we've improved service overall, faster service, better service, to our taxpayers through these solutions. So two and a half months ago, I made this decision. I wanted to run a campaign. I knew that this day would come and that there would be an appointment for another position in District 2. Despite that, I made the choice to honor our democracy, to honor our residents, and go through the public process of running a campaign so that the voters could vet me. I hope that you've taken all of this into consideration, and I hope that you make the right decision tonight, whatever that is. Thank you very much for your time. All right, so uh, questions for Alex. The lawyer give you a book to read on State Street? <laughs> <laughs> or College Street? <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> uh, um, I, I guess I'll, I'll um, ask, what would you say is your highest priority um, for the city? Yeah. Uh, supporting the effort to expand housing. There's a lot of people that really want to get onto the property ladder, uh, that want to find good housing here in the city, and, and uh, I think that's a great thing. And I think a lot of communities would kill for that. And what do you see as Montpelier's biggest uh, challenge? That's not housing. <laughs> that, that's not housing. Yeah, right. Um, so uh, it's sort of in the name of housing, but I, I think that infrastructure planning is, is a huge challenge, and it's been a huge focus of the city council over the last several years, and I think it needs to continue to be in, in the future years. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, so again, we're going to hear from all the candidates uh, first, and then um, opportunity for the public to comment. So uh, I think next. If it's, if it's by last name, it's Lalitha next. Oh, first okay. Name is Jeff. Well, <laughs> what? Uh, whatever you want to do, you would like to go. <coughs> um. You want me to do it? Stand stand it's probably best okay. to go up there, I think. Just for the angle. That's right. <laughs> a good camera angle. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't done public speaking for a while, so I'm a little bit nervous. Um, <laughs> but when things need to be get done, I will do it. Um, so just give me a few minutes. I just, I'm sorry I'm late because I had, uh, my son had a concert today at Union Elementary. Uh, it starts at 6 and at 7, that's why it was late. <sighs> okay, um, I'd like to start by thanking the council for considering me and also to say that I'm impressed um, with all two candidates for this open position. Um, while there are pluses and minuses to each, uh, the council will be enriched by whomever they choose tonight. Um, but first let me address the elephant in the room. There has been a lot of politicking and frankly backbiting amongst the supporters of each of the candidates. And I would like to clear the air. Alex Geller's supporters argue that since he ran in the actual election and came in second, he deserves the seat. While I can sympathize with that position to a point, I think it misses the mark. Had both seats been vacant in the election, 
voters would have had the opportunity to vote for two candidates. And in that kind of election, there is no telling who would have come in second. It would have been Alex. It would have been Eastman too, and Eastman. We will never know. And uh, since we can't know who the voters of District 2 would have chosen second, it Yay. seems to me that what the council is doing is fair and following the rules of our city's bylaws. So I urge the council to consider the candidates on their merits alone. But I said earlier, um, each of our candidates have our own, own unique gifts to bring to the council. Jack has his, I have mine, and Alex is own. The council members know best the council's own needs and lacks, and I will trust them to make the best decision for the citizens of Montpelier as they see it. But let me now speak just a little bit about what I hope to bring to the council, should you choose to name me to the seat. As I said in my application letter, I would bring the voice and experience not only of a woman of color, but as an immigrant who has achieved citizenship here in Vermont. I bring the voice and experience of a single mother, single father, who has lived on the edge emotionally and financially with the scars to prove it. And this matters because it seems to me that Montpelier is reaching a crossroad. Montpelier has much to offer, but at the same time, it is a difficult city to live in for people who are poor. So we have a decision to make. Do we want our city to be of and for the privilege alone? Or do we want it to be diverse, cauldron of all types, all kinds, with the benefits of such diversity has to offer? If the later we must walk the tightrope of reigning in spending to keep our city affordable, while at the same time spending such monies as are necessary to rebuild our infrastructure and encouraging the flow of ideas among all our citizens. Governor Scott has spoken about the need to attract businesses and businesses people to Vermont. And Montpelier needs to do its part. But how do we best go about doing that? Not by enticements? Enticements may get them to come here, but they won't keep them here. We must make a Mont Montpelier a place that people want to come want to open a business in. And we do that by focusing on our strengths as a community of business and citizens who support each other, as a council who works with businesses to help them succeed, and who works with all residents to help them succeed as well. We can and must build each other up and fight the urge to tear each other down. And Watson, you were talking about uh, what are the challenges. I know that uh, uh, we were talking about the housing situation, so I will not uh, talk about that again. Um, the issue that is dear to my heart, not only to myself, other single mothers that I've spoken, parents uh, who have two jobs, they still cannot make end means, you know, it's very expensive, is quality, affordable daycare and summer camps. The state offers financial assistance to the truly poor, those who are already on welfare. But there is nothing for the working poor, people who eke out a living but have no savings and no extra money for things like high quality after school care and summer camps. I would like to have the city work with all the different programs available here in Montpelier and hash out a system of sliding scale assistance for those in need. For example, I will have to, usually I send my kids out to the Montpelier Recreation Center. It's quite a distance for me. My kids are bored out of their mind there. I'm, I'm being frank. It's like a big, huge daycare. They have one system from create kids from four years old, five years old to older. And I would like to send my kids to the summer camps here or day camps here, but I cannot afford. Uh, it takes half of my paycheck. I have two kids. I want to give them uh, the opportunity like anybody else here. Music, dance, arts. But it's very difficult for me. But I try my best. Um, and I've spoken to a lot of parents. They have the same issues as well. 
I'm sure if you're parents, you want to give the best for your kids. So it would help the programs by attracting a larger and more diverse population of participants. It would help many of the city residents by offering assistance with the financial burden of daycare and camps. And it would help all of our ch children. And done right, it need not cost the city overly much. There are some attitudes, beliefs, and ideas I would bring to the city council. While it is important to speak of grand ideas, and of technical points and data collection, it is equally important to bring in the human element, the awareness of and empathy for the people who quietly and courageously struggle every single day to keep their families together and afloat financially. This is the awareness I would bring to this body. I feel deeply that I would be a good addition to the council and, uh, and hope that I am given the opportunity to serve. Thank you very much. Great questions for Louisa. Well, I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can you tell us about, um, uh, I mean, you, so you uh, didn't run in the, uh, the original uh, um, um, race for the seat. Uh, can you tell us either about why you didn't run then, or what changed for you, um, you know, between then and now? I meant to run, mm -hmm. but I had some uh, family thing come up. I also fell down a ladder while painting my house, and I hurt my foot. So I was in a boot in crutches for three weeks. So and I had kids to take care and dinner to make. And uh, when I got well last week, I just found out about this position that was open on Monday. So since then, I've been out after work, after making dinner for my kids, make sure they're okay. I take my clipboard, I go to College Street, all the streets, and talk to people and get their signatures. And that's why it was the last minute of the... Uh, Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. All right, okay. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. I everyone up here knows me. Um, <laughs> but for people in the room who don't know me, I'm Jack McCullough. I've uh, I've lived in Montpelier uh, since nineteen eighty three. And I love this city. I think this, I, you've all heard me say this before, this is the best place in all of Vermont to live. And, and I really mean that. I've uh, raised my two sons here. They got great education from, uh, from Montpelier schools. They uh, have gone on to, uh, to their own lives. One of them is still living in Vermont and hopes to move back to Montpelier. And at, my vision is that he would be able to move back to Montpelier and, and live here in a place that he can afford. Uh, as I was thinking about my, uh, my life of, of service, I, I think about uh, when I was growing up in New Jersey, um, our house was one house from the end of the block. And uh, so we were there, we had a long driveway, Long, we had a short driveway, long sidewalk. The house next door to us went up to the next road. Back in those days, we'd still get snow in the winter. And, uh, and when we'd go out and, uh, and shovel the sidewalk, my father would never let us stop at our property line. My father insisted we go all the way down, shovel the, the sidewalk all the way down to the end. That, that was just part of our responsibility to, uh, to serve the community, to not just parcel out the tiny bit that we, uh, we were responsible for, but to be responsible for the, uh, for the entire area. And we were. In my city, uh, in my town, a little bigger than Montpelier, my father ran for mayor. When I was uh, in eighth grade, I went 
door to door, delivered pieces to every house in our election district, uh, 1,000, 2,000 houses, something like that. Um, and throughout my life, I've been involved in public service. I've been uh, uh, a legal aid lawyer since 1979. I've uh, devoted my life to representing people who are uh, impoverished and disadvantaged and powerless. And what I do now is work in the Mental Health Law Project of Vermont Legal Aid, representing people in involuntary mental health proceedings. And uh, so my professional life has always been service. My life in the city of Montpelier has also always been service. I have, uh, I started out, like many people do, doing things with my kids, coaching the teams that they're on, working on the uh, union school parents group. Uh, I was one of the people who worked on the uh, on building the uh, the playground at union school when uh, when the parents group got out and built the whole playground. Um, and since then, I've done a whole range of things. I've been on the housing task force for almost 20 years. I've been the, on the Montpelier Housing Authority board since 1986. I've been the chair of that board for about 15 years. I've been the chair of the uh, Montpelier Housing Task Force for about 10 years. And uh, it's, I really tried to not only serve, as, serve the city, but to encourage the uh, city to move in a good positive direction. My vision for the city really is that uh, we should be, have all the good things that we have in Montpelier and expand on that. I think we have the uh, ability, having analyzed the uh, infrastructure of our, uh, of our city, we have the, the ability to increase our population by a thousand or two thousand in the next. 10 years and 20 or 20 years without putting undue strain on the uh, infrastructure and without really changing the, uh, the character of the city. We would still have everything we love in the city and, uh, and more of it. I'm very encouraged looking in the room today to see there are a lot of people in this room who are younger than me. And one of the things that I really would like to see is uh, is the opportunity for, for young families to move into Montpelier and to raise their family the same way I did. When I moved to Montpelier in 1983, we bought a house for $35,000. I was only making $16,000 a year or something like that. We could afford a house, to buy a house in the city. Um, <coughs> from. Uh, $35,000 in 1983 comes to about $87,000 today. There's no house that you can buy in Montpelier for $87,000 today or anything close to that. That, that particular house is assessed for around $150,000. And so a house, a family like my family, they have a very hard time moving to Montpelier, buying a house, and raising their family in the city. And I think that that is a loss not only to the family, families who would like to live here, but also to the city who are losing, <coughs> up, who's losing out on the contributions that families could be making here. So the main problem that I see in the city, the main challenge, is the lack of housing, the lack of affordable housing. Through the Housing Task Force, we've done a lot of work at uh, trying to address these problems. In 2011, I served on the Barriers to Housing Development uh, Committee appointed by the council. And uh, some of the recommendations, the, the recommendations are on the web page. Some of the recommendations have been adopted by the council in, uh, in our new zoning ordinance. And I think that that's very good. <coughs> um, there are other things that have not been addressed that I think could and should be addressed. Um, When I moved to Montpelier, I, I've been a housing guy for a long time. When I moved to Montpelier, um, I used to drive down Barry Street. And back in those days, 
the bottom of Savings Pasture, on the other side of Barry Street, there is a business called uh, Bevan's Speed and Cycle. And across the street, on the bottom of, uh, of the pasture, they used to park their, uh, their motorboats and stuff that they had for, uh, for sale. Um, and I would drive by there, and I would think, that would be a great place for housing. Well, here we are 35 years later, We've been talking about housing in Savings Pasture for that entire time. We still don't have housing. We have uh, we have a smaller population than we had 50 years ago. We have uh, more uh, households than we did 50 years ago, but we don't have the housing to uh, to support those people. And so that's one of the main things that I think we we need. The other. Uh, the second and third, probably the second largest concern to get to the mayor's question that I have that I think we really would like to need to address is the, uh, is the challenges of the business and retail sector of the economy. Now, when you go downtown now, there's a lot of vacant uh, storefronts. And I think in the last five or ten years, we've seen more than just the normal churn of uh, businesses opening, businesses closing, businesses move, moving along. I think we're seeing storefronts vacant for longer. And, uh, and I think that we need to address that. Having a growing young population, having people living in the town <coughs> to patronize, patronize those uh, businesses is one approach. But I also think the, uh, the city probably needs to take a more active uh, role at uh, talking to potential businesses, encouraging people to, uh, to move into the city. We have uh, upstairs spaces. Some of, the, some of them are being offered for lease as uh, offices. Maybe offices aren't the right use for that space. Some of those spaces maybe should be housing instead of offices. But again, that, uh, among other things, that requires uh, some investment by the city and staffing to uh, to do work with the potential developers to uh, to find the uses that will be uh, <coughs> that will be productive for those sites. Um, so what I what I see for us is really an active city government, a government that's going to uh, not necessarily be looking to trim what they do, but to in fact look for more opportunities to do more. And uh, that could in fact require uh, more investments in, in government than we have now. Because I know when I, we talk to people, when I talk to people in city agencies, they're constantly asked, well, why do you take on this new project? Why do you take on that new project? Those people, as talented as they are, and I know that Montpelier is able to hire uh, talented and dedicated employees, but <clears throat> they don't have surplus time to take on new projects. And so as we grow, we may need to consider not uh, reducing our employee, their staff, but actually seeing where, uh, where we can get revenue to increase the uh, the city employees so they can do the work that that's expected of. Uh, a perfect example is there's a lot of talk about um, about open space and parkland as a part of uh, part of Savings Pasture. I think that's a great idea. The people on that side of town really don't have a park that they can go to. Does the current parks department have the capacity and their current staffing to not only manage Hubbard Park and all our other parkland, but a major new park on the other side of town? Probably not. So if the city is going is hoping to develop a new park, we need to figure out what the uh, what the cost of that is and how we can what we can do to meet that cost. So I think I know that uh, I I probably spend more time at city council meetings already than anybody who's not on the city council. <laughs> uh, and, 
and I would like the opportunity to uh, to make it official, to <laughs> get on your side of the table and continue to serve uh, serve the city as a as a member of the council. Thank you. Any questions for Jim? Okay, well, I have the same question. Um, you know, in in thinking about, you know, there was this race that just happened and then the appointment. Tell us about either, you know, why you weren't running in that race or what changed for you between then and now. Um, just what was that process like for you? Mm -hmm. For me, the process was uh, pretty pragmatic. I knew that we had uh, two, two seats coming open and I was very enthusiastic that we were gonna have a great new mayor and uh, and e even before petitions were closed, and I didn't know, I, even before I knew you were the only person, I thought, boy, this is great. You're going to be a great man. I'm really, I'm not <laughs> sucking up. I really, really. Do. But, uh, but I knew, okay, here's an opportunity. We have, we have two, two seats here. How, how can we get uh, two people here with really strong, uh, progressive uh, positions to, to take these two seats? And I'm only one guy. I knew that I wasn't going to run and get elected to one and then come before you and get appointed to the other one. So it was a matter of uh, working strategically with other people to, uh, who shared my views to figure out, well, who's the best candidate to run for this office and, uh, and how can we put uh, the, the people in the positions that are going to be good for the city. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? I appreciate the candidates. You were very thorough, really. I couldn't think of a question. You were very thorough. Thank you. All, all three of you. Thank you. Great. Thank Thanks. you. All right. So uh, I know this is an opportunity for the public to comment. And uh, again, we're going to limit you to, to two minutes. Um, and we're going to we're going to test out our system here. Um, one hypothesis is that you might want to stand over there. Another hypothesis is that that's far away, and there's a lot of you, so maybe you, you want to stand here. What is your opinion, camera lady, person? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do have a name. <laughs> you know, do you have a name? What's your name? Rebecca. Rebecca, Rebecca. Rebecca. what's your opinion, Rebecca? Uh, either way words. You can also just stand on your seat, and Liz, that's bad. Okay, right. so... Um, as long as you're not right in front of me. Not what So no, one, one, one possibility is that you could stand where you... That they could yes. stand where they are. Yeah. I, I kind of like that. I mean, if I were over there, I think that would be easiest. Yeah. Um, I like that so, but then uh, one possibility is if you're there, can you see the timer? <laughs> you uh, or we can hold the can cards. Get cards. cards. Oh, yeah. Okay. I'm we'll, short, but my arm is. <laughs> we'll just, we'll just hold up the cards. Um, so, uh, Donna, are you uh, cool with timing sure. people? Is that all right? Anybody who, yes, yes. I will time you whether you look at it or not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. But you're, you're going to run it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we're not necessarily going to take, you know, people who are in favor of one candidate altogether first. I think we're just going to popcorn it. So um, if you would raise your hand and I will call on you and um, then you'll have two minutes to speak. All right. So who would like to go first? Go ahead. All right. Great. Oh, also, I'm sorry. If you would say your name and... Your street, um, sure. that would be that would be helpful. Uh, Ivan Shadows, Prospect Street. I just want to say first that I haven't talked to any of the candidates. I formed this opinion based on what I've read. All right. So to the council, by focusing on too narrow a sense of qualification, this council risks enforcing familiar inequalities between representatives and constituents. As the council often comments when making committee appointments, in Montpelier we enjoy an abundance of well-qualified volunteers competing for appointments. Individuals whose professional and political lives show a good record of pertinent work are likely to be selected. The problem which arises is that these lives are almost never those of us too poor and busy surviving to accumulate similar accolades for our letters of interest, or even develop much of an interest in municipal politics. In 2014, Pew Research Center found that financial security is strongly correlated with nearly every measure of political engagement, 
while the financially insecure are far less likely to engage. Yet we remain your constituents, whose interests you are sworn to represent. It is therefore heartening to see a council candidate, Lalita, who identifies herself among the not economically well off and places engaging the economically disenfranchised at the center of her bid for office. This council's power of discretion when making an appointment to fill a vacancy offers a unique chance to consider poorer candidates who may not have the time or resources to run a campaign. I hope you will take seriously your responsibility to correct the chronic underrepresentation of the poor in your appointment tonight. Thank you. Uh, I yes. suggest we invite Celia and her child to go next. So, oh, would they? I oh. think they would like to. Sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Which one? <laughs> so, I'll be brief, and I apologize for the interruption this guy is causing. But <laughs> <laughs> two minutes each. Yeah, right. <laughs> He's already had his two minutes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, right. It says Ba very well. Um, oh yes. So my name is Celia Rieschel, and I live on Downing Street. So that's uh, District Three. Um, and I wanted to start by just asking you to kind of ask yourselves what it is that your your task is today. And I think you know there's there's three people here that that seek to fill this this vacant seat that was uh, vacated by by Anne when you stepped up to mayor and. Um, we did just have this election that was, what, 20, 29 days ago, and um, in which there was a, an, a, a seat and, a, and a three candidates for the District 2 seat. And um, Connor, you, you won it with three 380 some odd votes, I think, and, and Alex Geller was another candidate, and he, uh, he received, what, I think 309 votes, and then there was another candidate who got 100 and some odd votes. Um, and I don't, I don't want to do like a civics lessons or anything here, but of course voting really is critical to the democratic process and one of the fundamental ways in which the public is able to voice and, and choose how they govern themselves is through the voting process. Um, and so of, of the three people who have put themselves forward at this meeting today, only one of them put themselves forward and, and respected the public's right to make that selection, to choose, and that was Alex. And, and 309, I think, people of his district did choose him to be his, their representative. And I think that is, that is uh, significant and shouldn't be, shouldn't be best. Um, and I mean no disrespect to the, to the other two who have um, put, them, put their names forward today, but by asking city council to name them to this seat after not choosing not, not choosing to take the opportunity to put themselves forward through that established process that happened last month to, ha to, to be selected for the seat, it strikes me as a little bit either reflecting not taking the position seriously, the position of the counselor, um, or perhaps not respecting the voice of the, of, the, of the residents of that district. And it seems a little ironic that in her proposing to speak on behalf of people so, that you would um your two minutes or... oh all right <laughs> well um, you want to finish your thought i will finish my thought yeah. only to say that i think your task um is is not to try to um you know, select a replacement for Adam Watson, but to simply ratify the decision that was already made by the represent or the residents of that district thank you yes Donna, I'm sorry that I made you interrupt them. I should do that. Well, I, I, I didn't see you. Okay. Sorry. sorry, go ahead if you'd say your name and your streets. Oh, my name is Roberta Tracy. I live on Kent Street in Montpelier, and I am a resident of District 2. An idea was floated recently on Front Porch Forum by Councilman Hutchison that um, perhaps, and I quote, since we're trying to fill the vacancy left by Ann Watson, who was elected last year to fill a two-year council term, an applicant who shares her characteristics or viewpoints might be preferred. 
As Councilman Hutchinson wanted feedback, here's mine. As a resident of District 2, I know almost nothing about Ms. Malawaganam or Mr. McCullough. Unlike Alex Geller, neither of them have sat in our living rooms, attended community events, or participated in debates so that we, the residents of District 2, could hear for ourselves their positions, their passions, and their visions for the city of Montpelier. Alex Geller did all of these things. He came within 70 votes of being elected council member for District 2. He did this through the hard work of candidacy. It has been suggested that we, the public, appreciate the process established by City Council for filling recent vacancies. However, unlike other recent council vacancies, this vacancy comes after a town meeting where the residents of the affected district spoke with their democratic right to vote for the candidate they would prefer to be represented by. It would be ill-advised for the council to ignore the voting results of town meeting day. It would be sending a very clear message that none of us should bother voting as our ballots that reflect who we prefer are not relevant and that council members know better than the members of District 2 Can you who to me? represent us. So, the residents of District 2 spoke loudly and clearly on town meeting day. I strongly encourage the council to acknowledge and respect this democratic process and appoint Alex Geller, council member district for two. To do otherwise would be a subversion of democracy. Thank you. All right, oh yes, so if you would, um um, if you would say your name um, and uh, your street, and then we're going to time you. So that yeah, yeah, no, okay, you got that. Totally okay. fine. <laughs> All right. um, I'm not going to be long. My name is Corby Griffin. I live on Liberty Street in District Two, and I'm, I'm just struck by the argument that I've heard twice now. And I came in late. I apologize. Um, my son was in a puppeteer show. Um, but I'm struck by the argument that because Alex came in second, he should automatically ascend to the seat. And, and I guess my difficulty with that is if both seats had been vacant and had been voted for, there would have been the opportunity for the citizens of District 2 to vote for two candidates, correct? That's how it works, right? So if we had had that opportunity, there is no guarantee that Alex would have come in second with the votes. Because at that point in time, Ben Eastman might have come in second. Um, so I guess my point is to, to use the argument that just because he came in second in that election, that he should automatically get the seat is, I, I get it, and it's, it's a valid argument, but I don't think, I don't think it's completely valid. Because when you look at the fact of if there had been two candidates, would he have come in second? He may have, but he may not have. All right. That's all. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Jake, and then Eve, you want to go next? Good evening. I'm uh, Jake Brown. Uh, I live at 115 College Street, and that's District 2. Uh, I'm going to be speaking on <coughs> behalf of Alex Geller, and I hope you'll appoint him to the council. But first, I want to be clear. I want to be, uh, thank all the candidates, including Jack and Lalitha, for their engagement and thoughtful participation in the process. We're lucky to have such interest in the seat. I think that's very important in my that said, in terms of the approach to seeking this seat, there is one very large difference. Uh, there is very one large difference um, among the candidates. Alex Geller is the only one among them, and others have said this, who has planned and executed a full-on district-wide election campaign 
and put his name squarely before the voters for their consideration. He's developed a platform, articulated thought pr proposals for the city, he's knocked on doors, he's greeted voters, he's canvassed over 800 homes in the city, in his district, and held seven Meet the, meet the Candidate events, among other things. In short, Alex Geller did a real campaign, and that sets him apart. Not only did he do a real campaign, one that demonstrated a distinct level of commitment, he garnered 309 votes. That's a respectable second place finish in this case. And the campaign was just weeks ago. It's a fresh sounding of the voters in the district. Something that doesn't often precede a, a proceeding like this. So Alex stands out for me uh, from these other candidates. No doubt, no doubt talented candidate. So as you weigh the merits of all these candidates, I, I would think it would be important to, to, to remember how the District 2 voters spoke. And I know you'll be working hard as a new council tackling the huge range of issues facing the city, and I wish you the best, and I really do hope you will appoint Alex Geller to join you. I think doing so, uh, in this case, is the most faithful to the spirit of local citizen-based democracy that we prize so much in Vermont. Thank you. Thank you. Check it in. Hi, I'm Eve Jacobs Carnahan, and um, I served on the school board for two terms, and so I know how difficult it is to make these kind of decisions, and I know that whenever you make these decisions, somebody's going to be unhappy, and you're always saying no to someone, and it's really difficult. But what I want to offer to you is that you've got a really um, advantageous situation this year because um, Alex Geller um, comes out of the election. And so you can look at a very recent election where you can say, OK, I know what the district was, was looking at. The district um, very clearly showed that there were two candidates out of the three who ran who, who rose way above the third candidate. So it wasn't close. And so you had um, the opportunity to essentially poll the district. Now, um, you don't always have that situation, and that gives you an advantage. When you don't have that situation, um, and if you were to ignore the choice of the voters in, in um, indicating how strongly they supported Alex, you'd be playing into questions of favoritism, um, personal relationships that people may have with the other candidates, um, anything that suggests that you'd be circumventing the, the will of the voters. And I don't know if any of those factors would be actually taking place, but those are like the suspicions that people will be having, and so I think um, any it, it, it's really best and fairest and best representative of what the district voters want um, to to go to the vote of the district voters. And actually, I realized I didn't say that I live in District Two and I live on St. Louis. So I I hope you will support Alex Geller. Hope you will choose him. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, go ahead. Hello, my name is Dan Boomhauer. I live in District Two, Kent Street. We know Alex because he campaigned door to door and came out to speak to the people in District 2. In this case, you have a candidate who went through all of the steps. He petitioned, campaigned, and lost by only 70 votes. In the past, when you needed to fill a seat, there wasn't someone who had run for the office that was still interested. Picking the runner-up is the rational way forward and has recently been the practice of the school board and the Parks Commission. This is the first major decision of the new council. Choosing Alex would be a way to unify the city. Doing otherwise would be divisive and you would lose the respect of 300 plus voters in District 2. If you should select a person who has simply petitioned for the office, the whole council would lose credibility among the voters and it would smell of cronyism. That is no way for a new council member to get started and to keep tenure. What we know about Alex is from his door-to-door -door campaign. He understands systems, he knows how to make them work efficiently so that housing and other future needs of the city can be met. He understands how to work with state funding systems such as the TIF and capital improvements. Alex is very pro-planning and concerned about housing. Housing is needed without compromising wastewater, water supply, increased traffic, parking and stormwater. Alex understands that infrastructure takes constant attention if the city is going to have a viable future. The decision you are about to make is going to define you. Are you going to be defined, are you going to defend democracy by supporting the process that got you elected? Or are you going to select someone who has not been vetted or gone through the electoral process? 
The support of the citizens of this city will, will that would, excuse me, the support of the citizens of this city will give you, what support they will give you hangs in the balance. Please make a great decision. Thank you. Thank you. Swango, and full disclosure, I am an interloper from Worcester. <laughs> but I'm a former resident. In, uh, I used to live on Barry Street. Um, and I'm essentially here as a character witness for Alex. That's right. Um, Justin. Justin Kenny. Um, mostly to talk about Alex. The last name? Listening. Kenny. Uh, mostly to talk about Alex as a, as a professional, uh, which I will, I've worked with him for the past five years. Um, three things in particular I want to note. One would be his work ethic, one would be his approach, and one would be his temperament, all of which I think are apropos to city council. So in terms of work ethic, I would call Alex a workhorse. Um, this guy will do anything you ask of him and more. Everything he does is at a like extremely high level of quality. Um, any project that I have worked with him on, and there have been many, both in his role in DEC and with AOT, um, he's done the work, and I don't have to worry about it. I never even have to ask him if things are going to get done. He gets it done. And it's not about for him recognition or praise, it's about that he values the work and he values the outcome of the work. So if the work is actually gonna have the intended impact which we're looking for. I think a lot of his work ethic was evidenced in his campaign of which he got 309 votes. Alex didn't have the benefit of resting on his laurels or working with connections and relationships, right? He had to work hard for every single one of those darn votes. And he continues to work hard today to try to get it on the city council seat. In terms of approach, Alex approaches uh, any problem with an inclusive mentality. So he does not go into something with a closed mind, very open-minded, right? And he will try to look at all sides of the equation to try to develop a solution which will work for everybody that's impacted. In terms of temperament, super even keel. I don't know anything that has ever faced him, which I think is important given some of the situations that the city council is gonna have to wrestle with moving forward. Um, so in my opinion, I think the choice is clear, given what other folks have said about the election and Alex's work so far, that he's the right candidate for this job. And one question I would have for Jack, not to point to you directly, but and one question I think the council should ask, if you've been working on housing for 35 years and things have not changed, what have you done and why hasn't it worked? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, others? Yes, Karen. Um, Carolyn, I live on Carolyn Gudinski and I live on Center Street and I'm supporting Alex and his platform and I actually he had one of his meet and greets at my house and I know Lolita Well from the Farmers Market and Jack McCullough from when I was on the Planning Commission many years and I'm thankful that they're able to put in their appointment for put their appointment forward for this position I also know Alex because I worked with him when I was at the Agency of Natural Resources several years ago. But the main thing I wanted to say, and I wish I had gone right after Eve, is I really support the democratic process to appoint the second vote winner. And somebody had mentioned when I was, um, the Parks Commission is an elected position, and when I ran for parks, I won by several hundred votes, and this was a citywide election. But the Parks Commission um, opted to have the second go-getter, which is who the citizens of Montpelier wanted to see second, and that's who we appointed to our commission. So I just think that's a very important thing to weigh in what the voters wanted in the community. Thank you. All right, any others? Uh, yeah, go ahead. I really want to look at my notes, but I'm not going to. <laughs> um, my name is Jill Remick. I am a District 2 voter. I live on the corner of Ewing and Lincoln. And I have to say that because my address is Ewing, but my driveway is Lincoln. It's very convenient. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm here. I sent you folks a letter, and at Glenn's request, I posted um, looking for a comment. I posted on front porch formal as well. Um, I'm very much in support of the council appointing Alex. I know it's not easy. Congratulations to Connor and Glenn, and congratulations to you for being appointed mayor. Um, and just quite frankly, because of what a lot of folks have already said, that the process was what it was. Um, it was a very strong second place after a really hard campaign. Um, I've been trained in running campaign um, as a woman, and I am pretty jaded about how some of this stuff works. And so I'm also very passionate about protecting it. And the seat belongs to the district. We have District 1, 2, 3. 
we have a voting process, um, and the district has, in my opinion, already spoken about who that second seat should go to. Um, and I can't, I, it certainly isn't a philosophical statement about any of the other candidates who have come forward. I just understand the work involved. I reached out to people I didn't know, and those I did invite strangers to my home because I felt so strongly about the work that Alex was doing. It is not easy, and I do not envy him, and I'm indebted to all of you as well. But it does take work, and I think that's indicative of what you get when you have Alex on your council. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Phil. Hi, I'm Phil Dodd, District 2. Um, you know, I think Jack and Lalitha have, have great qualities, as we've heard tonight, but I agree that because Alex Geller is the only one of the applicants uh, here tonight who made the effort, the significant effort, uh, to run, that um, he should get the nod. Uh, his efforts show real commitment to the job in the city and should be rewarded. Appointing runner-up in a recent election is a common practice in Montpelier. This was done by the Parks Commission and by the school board. In 2015, when two school board members were being elected, the third place finisher was Bridget Assay. Six months after that town meeting, a school board meeting res member resigned, and Bridget was unanimously appointed to fill the vacancy. The school board minutes of October 7, 2015, about that choice, specifically cite her vote total in the prior election. I think you really need to respect the, the voters of District 2, and um, including those who are here tonight. You know, I, Jack talked about the strategy and premeditation of trying to uh, achieve a certain result, but I think I think the we should look more to the democratic process uh, in, in making a decision here. I've read on front support forum that some people think another candidate should be appointed because his political views and inclinations are closest to those of the person who held the seat before. But how do we? know the views of these applicants? Has there been an investigation of their politics or a political questionnaire to fill out? Um, even if that is, you know, even if politics made some sense, neither, in neither of the most recent council appointments was there an applicant in the mix who had run for the office. So this is, this is what's different. There's somebody who has run. Um, many of us feel alienated from Congress and the president, and by the way, national politicians treat each other. In Montpelier, let's strive for unity and inclusion and do the right thing. The fairest decision for Alex and for the voters of District 2 would be to appoint Alex Geller to the City Council. Thank you. Thank you. Any others? Oh, yeah, go ahead. My name is Mike Reed. I live, at, I live on Greenock uh, in Montpelier in District 2. And I would just like to echo uh, most of the uh, sentiments that have been put forth uh, to support Alex. Um, I think uh, he's, uh, I spent some time with him, uh, had a house meeting uh, with him, and um, he's uh, clearly extremely qualified. Uh, he made the effort to run, which the others did not. And uh, he came in a very close second. Um, and um, despite what has been said, I suspect it's very unlikely that if the two seats had been open, that he wouldn't have won the, the second seat. There was just too much difference between the second and third uh, uh, number of votes. So. Thank you. Yes. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Dan Dickerson. I live on Charles Street in District 2. And I will further echo the previous echoes that uh, <laughs> I support Alex Geller for uh, this council seat. Um, he ran for office, he got the signatures back in January, and uh, he did uh, put on a good campaign, and so I support him today. But I also would like to say that I hope to see all three of these names on the ballot next town meeting day, because I do believe all three candidates are qualified, and it would be great um, to see the debate between the three. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Sorry? Yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> My name is Frances Dodd, and I live in District 2 on McKinley Street. And I wasn't planning to say anything tonight, but I feel compelled, so I will. Um, when I heard from Jack that he chose not to run because it would, he could have an opportunity to be appointed here, and that would um, give an opportunity for his views to align with the council and so on, I thought, 
that just doesn't work for me. It doesn't work for me for a couple of reasons. One is, when I was in high school in history class, I was not a good history student. There was one lesson that I learned extremely clearly, and that was that the end does not justify the means. That's about the only thing I remember from history. It was a lesson in democracy. You don't get there the way that you want to get there. You get there by doing the right thing and in the right way. And Jack, you know, if, if you aren't appointed tonight, and you have an opportunity to run again, and, and you may um, win in favor, you know, overriding whoever were, was appointed, and likewise with the others. That it's just the end does not justify the means, Machiavelli. Mm -hmm. We don't want to emulate that. The second is that I don't think the purpose of the city council is to uh, have a collaboration of those with the same viewpoints. I think it's important to have a variety of viewpoints, and that's how you come to better decisions. It's through conversation, exploration, challenging each other, that you get to the decisions that you need to get to. And that may, that may not be the easiest way to get there. And maybe that's part, part of why we, Jack hasn't accomplished all he wants in housing. But nevertheless, we're going to get there. And I really think it's important to respect the voters in creating opportunities for diversity on the council and to support the candidate who ran. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, just one more very quickly. I support, um, I'm Priscilla Minkin. I live on um, Greenock Avenue, and um, I firmly support Alex. We just had an election. It was a strong section, a um, strong vote, a strong showing. I asked the other candidates to run a year from now and let the voters speak. And I also um, was very disturbed by um, thinking that someone could circumvent a vote and get appointed. That was just a disturbing concept to me. I ask you to honor the voters of District 2. Just let's no, wait yeah. until and, 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 I yes, thank everybody's you. had their thoughts. Any further comments? Okay. Would you like to add? Yes. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Lalita Mailwaganem. Um, uh, just give me a second because um, there were a couple of questions that I want to answer. Um, Alex said he ran a campaign from January. Uh, if I were in a better uh, position, I would have run it. But I cannot match his campaign style. I do not have the money. I do not have the resources. Nor do I have a lot of time. Because I am the regular citizens of Montpelier, a working mother from 8 to 4.30. And I have two kids who go to school. Um, so that is one of the challenges that I will have if I were to run for a campaign. I was not, uh, like the other person says, circum, like Jack, you know, whatever word that is. Um, the other thing is, I don't remember the other thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, that's about it. Thank you. Thank Can you. I just ask a question there? Um, understanding that uh, this has been a discussion among the council, that it is really difficult to have a diversity of economic backgrounds on the council given the time commitment and I just want to verify that you're fully aware of the time commitment that it is yes uh, I spoke to my uh, ex-husband uh, that he had to support me to look up the kids when I have to go to the meeting and all this stuff knowing that I had the support and some of my couple of my friends that's where why I stepped in I really want to bring my set of skills my experience um, if you forget about the skin of my color Look at me as a mother. Um, I own a house. Uh, I work here. And uh, not only do I want to bring the best to my kids, but to everybody else as well. And um, truth to say, uh, yes, that's the one. The other thing I remember, um, Alex said he knocked on everybody's door. 
uh, I started the campaign on Monday, knocking on a, a few people's door. I had encountered some very hostile people. Uh, some of them would look at me, and when I talked to them, they would like, oh, shut the door. Um, so um, I think you saw me shaking a bit because um, that was, uh, I met a couple of people. There is one person in this room, which I will not mention. So it's a little bit like, whoa, what is going to happen? <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank uh, you. I, I do want to, since uh, uh, has had an opportunity to, to um, say something further, uh, Jack or Alex, would you like to add any um, final thoughts and, uh, and then we'll entertain a motion to go into executive session? Yeah, I'll, I'll just add that, um, you know, I knew full well uh, what the time commitment was. I reached out to counselors ahead of, ahead of this campaign to learn about what the position entails, in addition to attending all of the city council meetings. And if you know me well, you would know that I have a problem where I don't stop, and I'm not very good at um, watching sports on TV. Sorry, I can't <laughs> relate on that level. Um, but I, I always need to be doing something, and that something is, is serving on city council. That's what I want that something to be. Would you like to add something? Sure, yes, uh, thank you. I just uh, heard the question, uh, if I've been working on housing for so many years, where is all the housing? And my, my answer is, well, we actually, through the work that I've done and other people have done, we actually have housing that we wouldn't have had before. We've, we've enabled people, families to move to Montpelier with the First Time Home Buyers Program. We've uh, got the uh, French work going on the French block, which uh, the Housing Trust Fund has supported. We have the uh, condominiums on uh, Barry Street, which has been supported in part by the Housing Trust Fund, which, which I and the other members of the Housing Task Force uh, work for. We have uh, 58 Barry Street, which uh, was crea created housing there by, uh, by the work of the uh, Montpelier Housing Authority. It's not enough, but we have made progress. We have a new zoning ordinance, which, uh, which I worked hard to uh, bring about, and I think that uh, we've made progress. We, we can do better, and we must do better. Thank you. Do you have thoughts on anything? I, I'm short. <laughs> no way you can see me sitting down. I'm just, I really do believe in the process that is the resumes, uh, the interview, the application, separate from town meeting day. But if I were to look at town meeting day, I would see 487 some votes voted for two liberals because they ran against one another. If Alex had had someone more of his vein, I'm going to use the label conservative, forgive me for the labels, then it would be different. And that, that is a real reality. When I look at the vote, I look at the number of voting for Ben, who's very progressive, and Connor, who is more liberal. And so I see, I, that's why I don't want to look at that, because it's how do you interpret those votes when you have three candidates. And, and, and you're nodding my head, so you don't like the way I interpret it. So I don't want to look at that election. I just want to take Alex's very good application resume and look at those qualifications equally across the board. And to me, that's not subverting democracy. That's being fair. So that's just where I'm coming from. Okay. Yeah. I, um, I'm going to move that we go yeah. into executive yeah. session. Yeah. 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 He hasn't spoken yet. Yeah. So, sure. Uh, so I'm going to take just a couple more comments, and then then we'll we'll entertain a motion to go. Since you haven't uh, spoken, okay, thank, you. thank you. Yeah. So my name is David Kidney. Yeah. I've lived here for 35 years. I'm a resident of District Two. Um, in response to that, uh, among my friends, and just for those of you who don't know me, I actually consider Jack a brother in arms. I've worked for 35 years in public defense. I do the juvenile contract the last 10 years. For 20 years, I did the adult contract. I spent my whole life working. This, Jack's done the civil side. I've done the criminal side. But working for impoverished people, dispossessed people, the downtrodden. So 
my political views uh, are to the left. Uh, but I found in this campaign, I find that most of my, that my friends, my lefty friends, we don't look at labels so much, that I found that among the people I talked to, there's a huge debate, Connor, who congratulations on your win, uh, that the debate was between Connor and Alex. And people looked at both of them, not from, I didn't hear anybody say, I didn't even know that, actually, that Connor's to the left of Alex. I didn't know that. It, what I heard people say is, this is an incredibly qualified guy, the guy who won, absolutely. And I think people were like, but they also looked and said, this is an incredibly intelligent man, a man who brings a lot to the table, energetic. I, I can't do justice to him the way his friend did, who's worked with him. But I, so I didn't hear that debate of who, who's left, uh, who's the left person here. That wasn't a debate that my friends and I had when we voted. We, we didn't know, we, I've never met Alex. Uh, I didn't go to any of those uh, sessions. I, I didn't meet him at the door. I'm not around a lot, but, uh, and, but I was incredibly impressed with both of them and talked to a lot of people like, yeah, these are two really great people. Wouldn't it be great if they could both be on there? So I, I disagree completely I with this as a left. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I don't know if, I, I didn't know he was considered a moderate or right wing or whatever you're labeling that. I thought that I thought we had two great people, and most people couldn't decide who to vote for. And a lot of people I knew were flipping a coin right before they went in between these two really fine candidates. Different interpretation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's on the ground. That's on the ground. Uh, hang on, team. Um, so again, um, we're going to take. I think just because we we do have to to keep going. Um, so, uh, Steve, if you'd like to Thanks. comment. Mayor, and congratulations to you and the other two new council members. I'm Steve Cease. I live on North Street. I'm a resident of District 2. And I think uh, Donna's, Bates, uh, Donna's comments really crystallized for me one of the concerns I've had about this process. I would never have known that Connor was more liberal than Alex, or Alex was more liberal than Connor. I don't know what in heaven's name you're basing that on. And frankly, that to me is one of the most insidious potentials of this process, that the council will substitute its judgment for the judgment of the voters who reviewed these people, listened to them, reviewed their candidacy, and voted as we did with, I think, 85% of the vote for Connor and for Alex. I think that represents a really strong demonstration that this District 2 is happy with the candidates that we have and would be happy with Alex as the, as the appointee to fill the, the vacant council seat. So I'm asking you all to please consider that this is primarily a District 2 judgment. Don't make this a citywide appointment. Each of you bring in your own district perspective to this process. Let's leave it in District 2. Frankly, Connor, I hope that you will help lead in bringing your, 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 your fellow candidate onto the council. And that is my, that's what I've got to say. Please respect the vote of the district. Thank you. So I know there are some other people who want to make comments, and I, I think I, I know I just said like, oh, we're not going to take more. I think I, we would like to. If you want to have something more to say, that's fine. I guess I just encourage you to keep it very brief. If they haven't made a comment already, if they, they haven't, haven't spoken, right? Is anybody who has not spoken like to make a, a further comment? Okay, just wanted to check. So um, I know two people have just raised their hands who um, have spoken, but if you would like to say something that's great, um, again, just keep it really brief. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, I, I just, um, I want to affirm what these two have said. I had no idea. I had two qualified people. And I, I'm just really very distressed by what I just heard. And it feels like cronyism. And I expect and trust that Connor will lead the rest of this council to respect the District 2 vote. And I am very distressed by what I just heard because that was not in my mind. And I actually am very left and very progressive. And he was saying it qualified. Could be one of the so anyway, I'm, I'm just really, I, that was very distressing to hear that and then to hear that we were going to wait earlier because we knew there was going to be a seat open and that there would be a likely appointment. So it feels to me like the respect, the vote of the citizens of District 2 is, is really being challenged here. Great. Uh, Ivan. Uh, so it seems like a lot of people here are interpreting Alex's second 
place position as the equivalent of the results of a special election. Right. And something that might help us understand what to do is to understand why there isn't a special election. Why does <coughs> the council uh, appoint somebody? And is it simply expediency? It's the city charter, that's the it's required city in the charter. charter. That's how a vacancy is spelled out. That's what a vacancy is. Of, of course, but I mean, can we try to understand the spirit of the charter in making an appointment instead of an election? Just no. Okay. I mean, I don't know what it's been that way for years. I don't know what, like, what the thought process was. Okay. Anybody else? Oh, hang on a second. Um. Oh yeah, sure. Go ahead. Just real quick, I, I I hear everybody talking about the spirit of democracy, and and I am an ardent supporter of democracy. But Alex didn't win. And there is, an, and as you pointed out, sorry, I don't know your name, um, we don't know what would happen if there was another election between the three of these candidates. I would prefer an election, but that's, as you point out, not what the charter states. So, but to assume that District 2 would rather have Alex than any of the other candidates simply because he came in second is incredibly disingenuous. It's not, they might, but we don't know that. And to stand here and, or sit here and, and say it over and over again, he came in second, <clears throat> therefore he deserves a seat. I don't get it. I really don't. And I would encourage the council to look at the candidates based on merit. That's it. Uh, yes, right. Francis. So I'm going to make it really brief if I can. Okay. I don't know how to say this. Um, given the opportunity, you are representatives of the city. And the only ways that we have had an opportunity to make our voices known are to vote for those candidates who put themselves forth and to trust in your judgment. We will have another opportunity to vote the next time that there is an election. And we will be happy to consider all candidates who put themselves forth at that time. That's the process by which this government is set up. And maybe there are more ways that we need to support people who want to vote, who want to run for candidates, and like they care, need support to have the opportunity to run. I don't know what that process would be. I don't know if the city charter needs changing. Maybe there's a process to explore that. But I don't think that this is the moment to consider those other ways of doing things because this is what we're given. These are the opportunities that the voters have had. And these are the only ways that we have been able to make our voices known. Thank you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Sheila. I'm a District 2 voter. Um, I, I just really quickly, uh, I, I think it's really important to look at voting systems and, and how we create the most representative democracy that we possibly can. Um, it, se it seems like we have a little bit of a problem here of changing a system in the middle of the process, uh, where you know if we are to postulate about you know who represents from the electoral results on town meeting day the most, you know, uh, the, the will of the district two voters. It's just sort of impossible for us to do that with the current, because we started off, you know, with one seat was going to be elected by the voters and one seat was going to be appointed. So, you know, I, if, if we want to talk about changing the charter, I don't, I don't know how that's done. I'm totally new to this, but that's, you know, that's kind of a, it seems like a separate conversation to me. That's all. Thank you. Yes, Jess. 
I'm just going to add one thing quick. Regardless of the election, Alex got 309 votes flat, period. It's just a data point. It doesn't matter if he came in second, doesn't matter if he came in 15. 309 people in District 2 voted for Alex. Thank you. Uh, yes, Mike. Yeah, um, I would say the number of people who have uh, stood up and spoke, um, many of whom are uh, District 2 uh, voters, uh, is a pretty good indication of what uh, would have happened if uh, there were two seats available. Thank you. I would move that we go into executive session for the purposes of considering an appointment under, Bill, help me with the language. Oh, it's on the agenda. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, very good. Um, title in accordance one. with Title One VSA 313, um, because the appointment just has to do with the appointment or employment or evaluation of a public officer or employee. I'll oh, second. second. Uh, before we vote, I just want to say thank you, um, seriously, to all of you who came out and, uh, and uh, shared your thoughts with us. This is, we've got a very hard decision um, in front of us. So, uh, all right. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed? All right. So uh, we are going to head uh, upstairs to um, uh, a room to deliberate, and then we'll be back. I'm not sure when. <laughs> hopefully, well, hopefully soon, but we'll see. Um, and you, you'll still be here when we get back, right? Okay. Uh, I move that we come out of executive session. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, all right. I move that we recess until tomorrow, April 5th. That's what tomorrow is? Tomorrow is the 5th? 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 Yes. Uh, at 3.30 p.m. Uh, in City Hall. Second. second. Further. Well, do you have discussion? Would you like to say something? Um, there, there seemed to be some conversation earlier about some pre-conversations that occurred between the candidate or candidates and the council, and I'm wondering if those things did happen, whether those counselors with whom those things did happen would consider recusing themselves from any, any, any uh, weighing in on this, any, if they have, if it happened. There, were, there was some exposure of, of an idea here earlier on about some conversations that might have occurred before tonight. So I'm, on, I'm, I want to lay that out there as a concern I have. On what yeah. grounds would you recuse yourself based on a conversation? If someone has, um, has made a plan of some sort to support one candidate, in a given situation ahead of time, before hearing the evidence, before hearing and seeing what we've heard tonight, that would cause me concern. Um, I saw just put forward that um, it's pretty typical for counselors to form uh, opinions about any topic before um, arriving at council, and that um, that's not usually a reason to recuse oneself. Um, so if, if there was, uh, yeah, yeah, I guess I'll just leave it at that. It's not, it's not, it's not typical. I would just like to put that on the record. Okay, yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, that's it. Um, sure. Because that, that would suggest that this was not a, um, not a, a proceeding as it appears to be. Uh, that there was, um, there were some deals made perhaps ahead of time for support. And I'm not, I'm not fingering anybody in particular. I'm just yeah. laying it out there. Yeah, there was a conversation about that earlier, so I just wanted to play. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I, I, uh, yes, Phil. I'm just clarifying, I think, what Jake is saying, that we, we heard that one of the candidates strategized ahead of the deadline to sign up about what to do, and, and the question is, was that strategy discussed with any counselors? I see what you're saying. Um, I would say that I think we are all fried and we are not ready to have any more intelligent discussion tonight and I think that we serve the best interests of our city by doing as we have moved. Um, we need to still take a vote on that but <laughs> yep, yep, we do. Um, to reconvene. Um, and I, but I appreciate uh, that, that sentiment and um, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll certainly sit with that too. <laughs> um, yeah, no thank you.
Uh, all right, so any other discussion? Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And we did say it. Did we say a time in the 3.30? 3.30.